So in this video, we want to talk about uh, cosets of rings and quotient rings building up to something like a normal subgroup, but in the world of a ring. So let's suppose that R is a ring and S is a subring. And then first of all, we can define the cosets of S. So the coset of S with representative R, which we'll denote by R plus S, is equal to all elements R plus little s, where s runs through all elements of that subring. And I want to point out here that this is a really important distinction from groups. So within groups, your cosets are always determined by whatever your group operation is. So sometimes your group operation is addition, sometimes it's multiplication, sometimes it's composition of functions, sometimes it is multiplication of matrices, and so on and so forth. But with a ring, your cosets are always determined by the addition component. You don't worry about the multiplication as you're defining the cosets. As you'll see later, the multiplication will be really important, but not for the definition of the cosets. So cosets for a ring always look like R plus S, or like an element from the ring, which is called the representative, plus the subring. That's what, how we write it. And a lot of the stuff we get for free, like notice that R is an abelian group under addition, which means S is an abelian subgroup under addition. But abelian subgroup or subgroups of abelian groups are always normal. So as abelian groups, S is a normal subgroup of R. But if you have a normal subgroup of R, you can immediately form the quotient group. So this quotient group R by S, that's going to be an abelian group with respect to the addition. So like I said, a lot of stuff we get for free given the fact that um, the notion of a ring has this abelian group built into it. So the next thing we want to look at is what condition do we need on this subring? So that R mod S, which again, notice that's all cosets of S in R, um, when is that a ring? So uh, let's see what we really need here. So we need some multiplication of cosets to make sense, and we'll just take what would be the most standard way that you could write the multiplication down. So we need, let's say we've got a coset A plus S and a coset B plus S. And I should say here, A and B are elements from R. So in other words, we've got this coset of S with representative A, and we want to multiply it to this coset of S with representative B. And we're going to say that this multiplication should give us the coset of S with representative A times B. So we need this, and I'll put this in quotes, to make sense. So uh, that's kind of our goal. So in other words, whatever we have over here should be the same coset as whatever we have over here. So uh, let's write that in a bit more careful of a way. So in other words, we need this. For all S and S prime in S, we need, so A plus S, so that's a little s. So notice that's going to be inside of this coset times a plus s prime. So notice that this side is going to be inside of this left-hand side of this equation right here. So I'll like maybe underline this in blue and then underline this up here in blue. So that need, that, that's already inside the left-hand side just by the way that we're defining this. That should be B plus S. But what we want is for this to be inside of A plus B, sorry, A times B times S. So in other words, inside of that coset. So this... <clears throat> So let's point out uh, what we have and what we need. So what we have is this, and what we need in order for this to be well-defined is this. And from that, it will follow that these two um, objects up here are the same. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what that would take. So by foiling this out, we'll have the following. So we'll have A times B 
plus a times s prime. So that's like distributing this a through. And then we'll have plus s times b plus um, s times s prime. Okay, good. But now uh, notice that our goal is for this to be in the coset a, b plus s. And also notice that here we don't have commutativity, and that's why here I've got a times s prime, but here s times b. Okay, well notice that we have a times b on both sides, so we can get rid of those. Good. And then notice that this s times s prime is already an element from s, and so we can absorb that into this s. So what that tells us is that what we really need in order to make this equation up here make sense is a times s prime plus s times b needs to be an element from the subring. Okay? And so now what would it take for that to be the case? Well, what it would take for that to be the case is we need a times s prime to be an element from s and s times b needs to be an element from s because recall that this needs to be true for all um, a and b in the ring R and all s and s prime in the ring s. So the only way for that to be the case is for these two um, inclusions to happen. Okay, so this ends up actually being the answer to this question over here. What condition do we need on this subring s so that this is a ring? Well, the condition we need is the following. For all a and b in R, and for all s and s prime in s, we need a times s prime to be in s and s times b to be in s. So we can actually like uh, simplify that a little bit given the fact that in order to write a definition down we don't need this kind of multiplication happening in the background. We can trim that out and that's exactly what we'll do as we present the definition of what we're trying to get at on the next board. Okay, our goal was to show when the cosets of a ring formed a ring, and we motivated this following definition on the last board. In other words, we got a condition on the subring so that the cosets formed a ring, and that condition was given by the following, and we're going to give a name to it. So let's suppose that I is a subring of R. We say that I is a right ideal if for all I in R, sorry, all R in R and I in I, I times R is an element from I. In other words, if you right multiply an element from uh, the ring into the ideal, it's absorbed into the ideal. That's how you can think about it. It has this absorption property. So I'm going to point out that sometimes this is written in the following way. So if you take the ideal i and you take all right multiples of that ideal i by an element from R, that is a sub object of the ideal. So it absorbs that R into it. And then it's a left ideal if you just like switch that around. So for all elements of the ring and all elements of the ideal, R times I is the uh, in, inside the ideal. In other words, if we have R times I, that's going to be a sub, a sub object of I. So in other words, you absorb from the left. And then finally, I is called an ideal if it's a left and a right ideal. And now uh, we have the following theorem that's built off of our exploration as well as this definition. So if I in R is an ideal, and I should say R is a ring, then um, <clears throat> R mod I, which is given by all of the cosets, so that's R plus I as R ranges through all elements from R, is a ring. Okay, good. So even though this follows from our exploration, I want to do the proof here just for completeness. But the abelian group part I'll leave out because the, the abelian group part um, follows very, very easily. So I'll just say that um, R mod I is an abelian group. Good. 
because um, as a group, and uh, we have I is a normal subgroup of R, and that's because R is abelian. And any subgroup of an abelian group is normal, um, but then any quotient of an abelian group is abelian. So the next thing to show is that our multiplication is well defined. And this is going to look uh, pretty similar to our exploration. So what we want to do here is suppose that we have uh, two different names for things inside of uh, this would-be quotient ring. So in other words, let's go ahead and suppose that A, A prime, B, and B prime are in R where A plus the ideal is the same thing as A prime plus the ideal. So in other words, those are the same coset with um, different representatives. And then um, and B uh, plus the ideal is equal to B prime plus the ideal. So from this, uh, something follows like immediately, and that is A minus A prime is an element of the ideal. So that's really easy to see because what this tells us is that, um, is that there exists some element from the ideal on either side where A plus I equals A prime plus I, then you can move everything from the ideal to one side and everything um, that's not in the ideal to the other side, and that gives us this. And then similarly, we have B minus B prime is an element from I. Another thing that you could use here is just um, at the level of abelian groups, this is totally true. Maybe that's a better way to do it. Okay, so now here we can use the fact that I is an ideal to say that A minus A prime times B has to be an element from the ideal. So there's that absorption property. So we've got an element from the ideal times an element from the ring that has to land in the ideal. So notice this is exactly the same thing as saying A times B minus A prime times B has to be in the ideal just by the distributive rule. And then at the level of abelian groups, this is the same thing as saying that uh, the coset A, B plus I needs to be the same thing as the coset A prime B plus I. So now that we can do the same thing using the fact that this is in the ideal and multiply this by A prime. So here, let's also notice that if we take A prime times B minus B prime, that's going to land in the ideal, again, because of this absorption property. We've got an element from the ring, and then we've got an element from the ideal. Multiplying those, we have to land in the ideal. But then if we go ahead and distribute, that's going to give us A prime B uh, minus A prime B prime is in the ideal, which that's the same thing as saying that A prime B plus the ideal, that coset is the same thing as A prime B prime uh, plus the ideal, that coset. But now notice that we have exactly what we want. We have AB plus I is the same thing as A prime B prime plus I. In other words, if we expand that out, so the coset AB plus I is the same thing as the coset A prime B prime plus I, but that's going to be the same thing as A plus the ideal and B plus the ideal over here. That's that multiplication. And then on the right hand, that's the multiplication A prime plus I, B prime plus I. Good. So, in other words, regardless of which coset representatives you take, you get the same product, and that shows us that multiplication is well-defined. Um, now, uh, the next thing that we need to do is check that uh, multiplication is associative, but I'll leave you guys to check that and the distributive rules because those are all going to follow from the fact that R is a ring itself. And that's a good place to stop. In a future video, we'll look at a lot of examples of quotient rings.